This is the Fair Fight Initiative podcast brought to you by the Fair Fight Initiative, a nonprofit organization that crowdsources litigation to end mass incarceration. I'm Linda Franks, the executive director of the Fair Fight Initiative in Baton Rouge. And I'm Dave Cartoonan of the Fair Fight Initiative in Boston. In this episode, we'll be speaking to Max Rose, the founder and executive director of Sheriffs for Trusting Communities, who, with another organization that Linda is a part of, Communities for Sheriffs Accountability, just released a new study about the paid jailer and how sheriffs sit at the nexus of mass incarceration profiting off the warehousing of detainees as they await trial. We'll also hear the firsthand impact of America's broken system of mass incarceration from Amelia Herrera in our regular segment, It Happened to Me. We'll also have an update on the work of the Fair Fight Initiative, which was featured in a USA Today article about a Baton Rouge police officer named Jeremiah Ardwan, who was fired and is now seeking to blow the whistle on the corrupt and now defunct narcotics division of the Baton Rouge Police Department. And we'll share a way that one community is taking action against mass incarceration and ways you can advocate in your community in our Infinite Hope Report. But first, Dave, stop me if you've heard this before. But it appears in Harris County, Texas, there is a movement to stop the transport and transfer of over 500 uh, detainees in the Harris County Jail to the private, um, what word would I want to use to describe this company? For-profit. For-profit company LaSalle that runs uh, detention and uh, detention and correctional centers here in Louisiana. Uh, There are advocates in uh, Harris County that are working diligently to not only stop this process because it takes the loved ones away from their base of support, um, preventing them from being active in their own defense. Keep in mind that they are pretrial detained, but they are sending them to these facilities that are noteworthy for their abuses for their lack of accountability when it comes to the atrocious conditions that, and they're not even allowing the families in the interim, in the what they're saying is in the interest of safety, to even know where these citizens are being transported to. Yeah, we're talking about like 500 detainees from Houston, and the sheriff there is saying, well, this is overcrowding. This is overcrowding, Right. So they have to take the people to another state Mm. into a for-profit institution. What I really see here is a story of incompetence. Uh, Many counties have learned to deal with COVID conditions and keep the courts moving. And it's clear that Harris County has not. So now we have a situation where 500 people who can't get their day in court, which is the Sixth Amendment, right? Speedy trial have to be moved 300 miles away to a for-profit facility away from their families because Harris County can't clearly can't get its act together. Now they'll say it's security, right, Linda? Mm-hmm. But you know, as well as I do, that there are people here being held innocent before proven guilty who are charged with things where other people in Harris County who have money don't have to do this because they have paid their bail. There's just nothing equitable about this. Exactly. It's the pay to play system. It is the money incarceration system where they're going to make money hand over fist off of your human body um, if you cannot afford your bond. And they don't care how you're being treated. They don't care if you're safe. They don't care if you're um if your basic needs are being taken care of. And now we see that they don't even care if your family members can offer you support when you're at your most vulnerable. And, and I if just, you, yeah, if you haven't heard of LaSalle before, this is the organization that is, was behind the forced hysterectomies in Irwin County, Georgia, hmm. and they, they made money off of that. Yes, and I interrupted you. That's okay. That's <laughs> okay. There's a lot to be said here about the atrocious practices of LaSalle um, and their history. Um, so we, we, you know, our thoughts and our prayers are going out to all of the families. And we have a link, uh, to a media kit that an organization of attorneys and advocates is forming to try and help the 500 or so people who are going to be shipped out of state while they await, uh, seeing a judge on their charges. You can find that media kit and information that you can put to work for yourself 
uh, on our website, on the Fair Fight Pair Podcast website. Just look under links we mentioned. All right, Linda, now stop me if you've heard this one before, but voting rights failed. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what else to say about that. It seems the Jim Crow filibuster has done exactly what it was intended to do and again has stopped progress. And now we sit here sort of watching our democracy start to really unravel in ways, maybe not unravel in, in this moment, but you can sort of see it coming down the line. And and it feels pretty powerless to see what what may be coming and, and really one of the last you know, opportunities maybe that we had to to short circuit it has now been taken away by two Democratic senators who I don't know what's gotten into their heads. I'm speechless. Um, I'm not. I guess I'm, I'm I'm disappointed because I'm not surprised, right? Um, and the the biggest thing about this for me, Dave, really, and I'm sure for some of our listeners, is how in the world. Do we in a democracy allow for something like your voter rights to ever, ever come up to be questioned, um, come up to be modified? They should be made, you know, uh, celebrated and made as easy as possible in this nation that hangs its hat on, you know, everyone gets a vote on a democracy, on a, a government that is governed by and for the people, that everyone's vote should matter. It should be constitutional. Um, and it should we should never have an opportunity where where any of those rights should have to come up again uh, to be defended. It's just really embarrassing and appalling, I think. Uh, just like the definition of obtuse, right? I mean, nothing that they say that explains their behavior addresses the problem at hand, right? And then you have the unmitigated gall to celebrate John Lewis as being oh. one of your mentors, and then you know, Doctor Doctor King as is as one of your heroes, and here you are allowing for a group of people, um, because I'm learning that there are those in the Republican Party who have some common sense, right, about mm -hmm. this democracy, and they're not uh, buying into no, they're this not stepping separatist, up either, right? This, yeah. you know, separatist, we're about to lose our white uh, control over this country, so let's make sure that we do all that we can to make sure people can't vote um, and suppress the vote and going back to, like you said, those Jim Crow era type uh, situations. But you have them aligning themselves with people who really are being strategic about this power grab, you yeah. know, in the most despicable ways that you could possibly imagine. And, yeah, and do me a favor and like, don't tweet. I have a dream on oh. MLK day and maybe don't tweet your selfies with John Lewis. If you're going to destroy our democracy. Oh like, my goodness. Oh boy. I mean, just a word to the wise, you know, we see your hypocrisy. You yeah. cannot dress it up. You cannot hide behind Dr. King's picture or or, or uh, uh, John Lewis's picture and think that we don't see you. Yeah, and we, maybe learn one other MLK quote, just one, just, just one. one other. You know, and if you listen to the show long enough, you'll at least hear <laughs> one more, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, Dave, stop me if you've heard this before. Actually, this <laughs> is—I I don't mean to laugh. I stop you if you've heard me before. Stop me if you've heard stop this. me if you've heard this stop me if you've heard this before yes exactly so it's like a double cross double cross now we mentioned in an earlier podcast about george floyd's um conviction being posthumously rescinded well guess what uh excuse me posthumously overturned yes okay yes. pardoned yeah pardoned well maybe not Think again, okay? It's been rescinded. Yes, the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles has rescinded the recommendation it gave to posthumously pardon uh, George Floyd because the rules, right? I, you know, I could get into the the details of this, but it's always the rules, right, Linda? Yeah. You know, I I believe in a nation of laws, and I I believe in in the rule of law. However, when systems of control get threatened, they love pointing to the rules that they've created for themselves to make sure that they don't have to do the things that they don't want to do, right? Exactly. So here we have 
the rules being invoked. We didn't do it right. Or, you know, maybe we can do this later, which we know what that means, right? You'll just forget and we'll move on to the next shiny object. But mm -hmm. right now we, we've got to look at the rules and the rules, the rules, the rules. Yeah. The rules that we're not going to follow when it benefits us. Of course. But not. the rules we can hide behind, you know, to screw over whomever we want to. So. Yeah, it, it, it is tried and true. When you threaten the system of control, they always come holding up the rules, don't they? Yes, they do. Okay, Dave, I'm going to stop us there because we have heard this before. But until everyone has heard it, we won't stop talking about it. Our guest in this episode of the Fair Fight Initiative podcast is Max Rose, the founder and executive director of Sheriffs for Trusting Communities, and who, with Linda, is part of another organization called Communities for Sheriffs Accountability, who just released a fascinating study about the nexus of profit and warehousing people, and sitting at the center of that are our sheriffs. Well, good morning, Max Rose. Thank you so much for sharing your time um, and your experience uh, with our podcast listeners. And I take it very personally that you are here. You are one of my most favorite people in the whole wide world. And, um, you know, as I've been doing this work, it's been so funny how instantly God has allowed me to connect with someone on a soul level. And you're just one of those people, whether you feel the same way about me or not. Um, the work that I have been involved in with you has enriched my walk as an organizer, has empowered me as a person, um, and has really helped me heal through a very hard time. And I don't think you know that. Um, the platform that you and the amazing people that work with you um, at C4SA um, is just galvanizing. And I can't wait for our listeners to hear all about what's going on, uh, what's on the horizon. And as we like to put it in C4 lingo, you know, what we're throwing down on uh, together out here in these streets. So um, again, welcome, welcome, welcome. And I'm going to introduce you to my partner. I'm going to say partner. Don't crime. say crime. Partner in <laughs> justice here, Mr. Dave Partoon. And we got a guest <laughs> that we can start with news. I mean, yes. Max, you're making news. So tell us about the paid jailer. Yeah, I will. I, I will also just say to Miss Linda, uh, since it's just the two of us here, that it is mutual. And in addition that, to everything you just named, I consider you one of my personal heroes and your vision and your courage and your bravery is a central reason why I do this work. And I feel incredibly lucky to do it alongside you and so many other folks day to day. So couldn't let that go without without acknowledging and, and naming and thank you man how much I love you Miss Linda <laughs> I love you too darling <laughs> um, but Dave to your, your question the paid jailer report out on Wednesday mm -hmm. excuse me, out on Tuesday shows a, a system in which sheriffs are receiving campaign contributions and in return, they're building new jails, they're granting healthcare contracts, they're, they're selling commissary contracts, they're issuing meal, more concealed carry permits, and there's real consequences in people's lives. It, it leads to subcare healthcare mm -hmm. and, and folks dying behind bars. It leads to jails that shouldn't be constructed being, being built day to day. And, and it's a system that really begs the question whether sheriffs are making decisions based on our safety and our, what our community needs or whether they're they're making their decisions based on the highest bidder and it it shows roughly six million dollars across just over 40 sheriff's offices across the country so just the tip of the iceberg it shows that this is ubiquitous that this is a centrally run system and and it also just makes the case that if we even want a chance at a fair justice system and in and, and making sure sheriffs are doing their jobs, we've got to get this paid paid jailer, we've got to get this money out of the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a it's a form of legalized corruption, I think is the yeah. is the best term that you can that you can slap on it. And 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 to say that it's just 40 sheriff's offices. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you talk about a state where sheriffs are the most powerful political figure in their community. Georgia has 159 counties on its own. That's mm -hmm. 159 sheriffs just in one state. And 
I, I think I'd like you to, you know, for either the, the passive listener or for the very engaged listener who understands what a sort of insidious arrangement this is, is to take one example, whether it's commissary or phone calls or healthcare, mm-hmm. um, and break down the pay for play arrangement that that creates this form of legalized corruption, where the only way to make it profitable is to continue to deliver inputs. Mm-hmm. And I say inputs very mm-hmm. clinically there because this this system relies on largely poor black and brown people to be inputted into the system to continue the profit model to run. Yeah. So most of y'all's listeners will know that sheriffs control roughly 80% of the jails in the country. And and those jails almost entirely are actually publicly run. We think of private prisons. There aren't many private jails. Um, But where the private sector has an interest in jails is in millions in some places, tens of millions of dollars of contracts that have a real impact on the day-to-day lives of incarcerated people. And, and probably the most covered and, and the, the kind of contract that appears most clearly throughout this report is with healthcare vendors. Mm-hmm. So take the case of Massachusetts and Thomas Hodgson, the Bristol County Sheriff in Massachusetts, but this, this is also true with sheriffs in Louisiana, and we can get to that in a second as well. CPS Healthcare is the healthcare provider to the Bristol County Correctional Facility. Thomas Hodgson has received more than $12,000 in donations from from CPS. We know nothing about the outcomes for CPS. We don't know whether people who come into Bristol County and are incarcerated turn out with better healthcare outcomes. We don't know about if you have a substance use issue, whether they're fixing that in jail. All we know is there's a major contract going to a big campaign donor to Thomas Hodgson. And, and in that jail, dozens of folks are dying, some by suicide, some by overdose, with zero consequences, zero independent investigation, zero transparency to, to what the role of CPS healthcare is and isn't in that system. And CPS, we saw throughout the, the sheriffs in Massachusetts, but you can insert a different healthcare company in a different place. Ms. Linda will remind me the healthcare company Company in East Baton Rouge, correct health. health, yeah, and in Georgia as well. Mm-hmm. Horizon yeah. too. I, I've, I've got the scars from. from- yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, correct health in the East Baton Rouge Sheriff's Office has put substantial resources into that Sheriff's Office, and and we know um, quite well the results in, in East Baton Rouge. Mm-hmm. Oh, most definitely, most definitely. I will say that you know. Um, when I became affiliated and, you know, with the organization of, of shares for trusting communities and subsequently the communities for shares accountability, you know, just the meticulousness of what we knew, the comprehensive way that had, it had to be approached, but the money was always the backdrop, right? We knew that coming in, but the educational, um, implications of this report, this paid jailer report. We just had an opportunity on yesterday. There is a group out of Houston who is fighting because they have pretrial people, you know, that are being transported into a private correctional facility. But we were in real time able to maybe give them a strategy of lift there's this resource out there, this paid jailer report that has come out and you may find that your sheriff, you know, has a tie to this particular facility. So can you speak on the fact that as you, as you were formulating and even coming up with the concept of doing this campaign, uh, this analysis, what you felt it could be as a resource to people who are looking to really delve into the power that is levied by the sheriffs in these communities. Mm-hmm. I'm so glad to hear, Ms. Linda, that it's been useful. And I think the, the actually origin, and I don't think I've told you this, may have been in our work with you all in East Baton Rouge, because in, in this report, you'll see uh, several references to Sid Gotro, the sheriff there, one of the worst offenders in the country. And and Ms. Linda, you and and Reverend Anderson and Michael and others had been pointing out these 
contracts and how how corrupt they were and how poorly executed they were and how it had real consequences in people's lives and then um, and then naming that it was also almost impossible to tell who the sheriff contracted with because it wasn't open and it wasn't public and certainly hard to compare the donations to the sheriff with with those contracts so um I mean, I think the origin of this was working in with organizers like y'all and and seeing that this was ubiquitous, that that if we wanted a system based on safety, money in in sheriff elections from private interests cut across every community and that we needed to call that out. We needed to take that that money out of the system and we needed to do that in part so that advocates can can make a case that that's based on justice. Yeah. Was there anything, uh, you know, you live this work, but when you compiled it, was there anything that surprised you? I don't think we've had a single sheriff in here that we examined where we didn't find a potential conflict. And that might've been the biggest surprise. And, and, and that shouldn't be a surprise. The, the institution of sheriff is pretty rotten. We, I like to quote, James Baldwin saying the Republic hired the sheriff to keep the Republic white, to keep the sheriff free of sin. And, and the sheriff fundamentally has done that job for as long as it's been in existence through convict leasing and uh, through racial terror lynchings and through their own deportations today. The, the ubi- and, and what that means is that the system has developed in a way that is pretty consistent across the country. They play very different roles in in different parts of the country, but what is consistent is that the sheriff is really central to over-policing, over-incarcerating communities of color, and and that they are motivated by, in part, these these private sector companies. So I, I think the ubiquity is one thing that surprised me. I think the second thing that that really surprised me was the range of companies we find in here. Some of it is big national corporations like the healthcare corporations that we just named. Some of it is the gun range down the street that has a real interest in a sheriff issuing more concealed carry permits so people can carry more weapons so they'll be able to practice more at the gun range. Some of it is energy companies who want sheriffs to protect their their land from pro, from First Amendment protesters. Um, it, it is big companies, it is small companies, and it is in almost every single industry that has a financial interest in sheriff's office. Yeah. I, you know, having, having been impacted in, in my reporting career by, by these practices, I, I was not the sort of casual reader of this and, mm-hmm. and even recognized the names in Bristol County, which is one county away from where I live and Johnny Wilcher and the county I used to report on. But I, I, I think the part that kind of sank home for me was that it was everywhere. It wasn't just in Southern communities. Mm-hmm. It's in New England communities. It's in California. And, and you talked about how the model has been set up the same everywhere. However, what, what I don't think people grasp is that this because of the way we select our sheriffs, as opposed to the way that we select and certify our police chiefs and our police officers, that that you can really distill this down to almost political, I don't wanna say armies, but political security forces, uh, where their interest is not only serving their donors, um, but exacerbating issues that call for the need for more security. Right. And I think we see that in the proliferation of sheriffs in the anti-vaccine, anti-mask movement in our anti-small D democratic movements across the country. And I would say this this report and and our work doesn't look as look to policing as a model or police chiefs and police departments. And it's important to acknowledge that that sheriffs present this really unique set of issues that has a lot in common with police chiefs. But what we're what we're going towards can't be um, the kind of policing that that was the subject of amazing mobilization around the world after the murder of George Floyd. It's got to be a 
more fair, more safe justice system for all of us. So. Yeah, I know one of the exciting things for me um, and, and in the work that I do specifically in Baton Rouge was that, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement and all of this social justice that has pushed forward. And a lot of it was so focused on the police department, right? It was always about the interactions between police officers and citizenry. And what I always, and I what, what my community will tell you that we've always known the power of sheriffs, right? But it's almost, and I think when me and you had a conversation, I likened him to the Wizard of Oz, right? He's the one behind the curtain that so many people don't know about. And it was so refreshing. And so um, I got so excited to hear that there was this organization that was focusing dead in on, you know, co communicating to the public just how powerful sheriffs are. So I'm going to shift a little bit from the paid jailer, which is a baby of what has been born from the, you know, from your organizations. And I I really want you to in, uh, educate our, uh, our our listeners on just what um, you know. Shares for trusting communities and the C four SA really is all about, and how important it is to focus these issues when we're talking about criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I um, I want to just name uh, echo something that you just said, Miss Linda. Folks often say. No one knows who the sheriff is. No one knows what the sheriff is. And that's just not true. If, if you've had a loved one who's been in jail, if you've had a loved one who's been deported, and if you live in a rural area, it's not true. We, there's a poll that came out of North Carolina that showed that 56% of rural North Carolinians can name their sheriff more than can name their U.S. senator and congressperson, more than can name... And this is a, a North Carolina uh, fact that will, will, and anybody who loves college basketball will understand why this is powerful. More people in rural North Carolina can name their sheriff than can name Mike Krzyzewski and, and Roy Williams, the coach, former co the coach at Duke and the former coach at UNC Chapel Hill. So the sheriff is an incredibly ubiquitous figure in a lot of people's lives in this country. And so I was not the first to pay attention to the sheriff. There have been generations of organizers, yes. Yes. mostly Black and Latino folks and Indigenous folks who stood up to convict leasing, who went down mm -hmm. to Mississippi to fight sheriffs who were trying to prevent voting, who, who in Florida, Harry T. Moore, one of the first martyrs of the civil rights movement, lost his life uh, going against Willis McCall um, in a in a really powerful campaign that's chronicled in a, in a book by Gilbert King that I'd really recommend to folks. So I, I always try to um, preface talking about my work or our work together, Miss Linda, by saying I didn't discover sheriffs. Why? There is a long generation of folks who have been fighting sheriffs. I had the pleasure of working in partnership with a lot of those folks. And, and I do that through an organization called Sheriffs for Trusting Communities, which supports organizers across the country. And we do three primary things. We help folks understand what sheriffs do and, and build a different vision for the sheriff. We do a little bit of direct election work, and then we work with partners to hold sheriffs accountable and make sure policies go through that, that really protect communities. And as a part of that work, I've had the amazing pleasure of, of helping to build with you, Miss Linda, and with other organizers around the country, this coalition called Communities for Sheriff Accountability. So I, I can do the overview of Communities for Sheriff Accountability, but Miss Linda is on the steering committee as are four or five amazing other organizers across the country. And it launched in August to, of 2021 with a really powerful vision that we can build a world that is safe, that doesn't depend on the sheriff and where communities take care of each other. And we have a fundamental freedom of movement. It launched with seven powerful policy demands, which you'll be able to find at sheriffaccountability.org. And all of its work is focused towards that vision, towards those demands and towards building a, a movement of 
communities who have been affected by the sheriff's office who are going to make this happen over the next few decades because this is a long fight. Does that feel accurate to you, Miss Lynn? Is that is that what we're <laughs> Yes, Max, you did very well. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to hear more from you, Max, about the accountability part, because when we were talking with David Utter, who's one of the founders of Fair Fight Initiative and, and does the legal side of the work, uh, he was talking about the 11th Circuit decision where sheriffs are immune uh, in plaintiff's cases when someone dies in custody. Mm -hmm. um, deaths in custody is something that both Linda and I are very familiar with. And um, you can't name a sheriff in a lawsuit like that. You can name your jailer who is making $19,000 a year and doesn't have any assets. And it's not that you're seeking jackpot justice and holding someone accountable, but when there aren't any assets, you know, to pay for a lawsuit, there aren't any lawyers who want to take the case. Um, there are obviously elections to hold people accountable. However, if you live in a rural North Carolina community that is say 75% white and 25% black, there probably isn't a whole lot of prospect for progressive change. Mm -hmm. What do you find are the, the best, most impactful ways in this moment to hold sheriffs accountable? Yeah. And, and I, I mean, Dave, not to take issue with the what example you gave there, but I'd say there's a lot of rural conservative folks who are fed up with the justice system. And there is a little prospect in, mm -hmm. in say, Thomas Hodgson's case, where he's spending millions of dollars of taxpayer money and and not taking care of community safety. So I there there is there's demand for change in the sheriff in places that we don't expect there to be demand. But to your point, elections are not the only mechanism for accountability. They're just one one of several tools we can use. So I, I usually talk about four or five tools. Elections, which we've already named, budgets, county commissioners, parish supervisors, uh, board of, uh, boards of supervisors often have the purse strings. And we've got to really better understand where sheriff's money is, is going, what it's going towards, and what kind of outcomes we're getting as a community for that money. Third, state policy change. We, we really have, have let sheriffs run rough, rough, excuse me, run, run over our state legislators across the country. We're still allowing practices like solitary confinement, which mm -hmm. folks have compared to torture. We're still allowing a lot of sheriffs total discretion and cooperating with ICE. So there's a lot of, lot of possibilities for accountability at the state policy level. Litigation, but as you've named, that has some limits, although there's frontiers still to be um, deployed. And then the last, which I often think of as the the least useful to us because it's so hard in different places is that a lot of states are able to remove their sheriff through the governor, or through the attorney general, or through the prosecutor. And, and what I always encourage is have a really clear analysis of where you want your community to be, what, what safety looks like, what are the mechanisms available to you because it does differ state by state, although we can help understand those mechanisms. And then then have a, have a clear analysis of which path is most useful and most possible in your community. Some places it'll be litigation, some places it'll be elections, others budgets, and some in, in some community. And, and some in some combination, excuse me. Yeah. Okay. So the back to the paid jailer, because it's such an amazing tool that is going to help so many communities with just the very things that you just listed. Because I think nine out of 10 of them, right, are wrapped around where is the money coming from? Where is the money going, right? Because I know here in Baton Rouge, we move the needle a little bit. We're just simply asking the question, what do you need this tax or this millage tax for? So it's so very important. I want you to speak a little bit about the people and how they went about getting this information um, and how people in the communities can help to add to this report, right? Because there are a lot of people who are doing this work and they've got, you know, piles and piles of notes and not really understanding what powerful information they have. So speak about the construction of the report, how you guys kind of came together and then how people can link in and even add uh, to make this a more comprehensive report. Yeah, well, this was amazing, amazing research 
And I'm glad that I was not the one as much involved in the day-to-day <laughs> research because, because we have these sheriff's offices that are incredibly opaque. Mm-hmm. Yep. Sheriffs aren't required to tell us where tens of millions of dollars go. <laughs> And it takes arduous public records to get that basic information. Campaign finance, where who, who gives sheriffs money is a little bit easier to find. So what I required was more than 100 public records requests to sheriffs across the country from John Henry, who was working for Common Cause. We got back roughly 48, 47 of those records requests. And then comparing that to campaign finance reports that look really different in different states. Some states make campaign finance reports available at the state level. And then, and then the other really important part was testing that data with our community leaders who, who know this stuff day to day. So we had a series of meetings that included East Baton Rouge Paris Prison Reform Coalition and Bristol County for Correctional Justice and chapters of Common Cause and said, here's what we're finding. Does that resonate? What's different? What are we missing here about the story we're telling? And and all that led to to this report. But John and team at Common Cause did amazing, arduous work. And and part of what we've got to do here is make sure that information is more easily available to the public. And so to Miss Miss Linda's point, to your point, some of that can be done by us and you can sign on at the, the paidjailer.org as an organization to find out more uh, about next steps on the data collection. But some of that has to be done at the legislative and county level. Mm-hmm. We, we can't be the ones doing the basic function of holding our government accountable right. for this incredible power that they have. So um we will do more data collection. We will put more data out there and, and we'll do that at the pagejailer.org and hopefully with folks help who are listening. So we'd love to hear from you. Um, but we've got to combine that with, with this information being accessible to the public from, from the government. Max, I'm afraid to ask, but is there a good example? Ooh. Is there is there an example of a sheriff's office? I know you're going to cut this out, but when I tell you, you are asking the questions (laughs) out of my freaking head, you know? (laughs) This is so spiritual. This is so spiritual right now for me, Max. Having both of you guys here. And I mean, go ahead. Why why won't I cut that? I, I hold the editing button, Max. So I think Linda's afraid that I'm going <laughs> to take out all the personality here. But like that, that was good for me, Linda. Why would I cut that out? <laughs> I find my rays of light in, for example, the leaders of communities for sheriff accountability. And I, I like to, I like to think less about good and bad sheriffs and more about what is our vision for justice and what's the new role that the sheriff is going to play. And then the the good sheriff becomes the sheriff who is following following the lead of community and making a system that is smaller and where fewer people are arrested and people aren't dying in jail and we're not building new jails. So there are really good examples of sheriffs who have listened and said the justice system isn't working. The, The one that I actually like the most is Morris Young in Gadsden County, Florida, who is in a conservative rural county right next to Tallahassee, has dramatically reduced the number of people sending to state prison, reduced the size of the jail, has stopped arresting for basic drug charges, and, and has done so while making the community more safe, has really demonstrated that this is that this over-policing, over-incarcerating model isn't isn't doing anything for our safety. And there's sheriffs who are doing okay work with mental health inside the jail, who have cut off ICE cooperation, or have said they won't build a new jail. And Susan Hudson in New Orleans is a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. Build phase three. But um, I, I don't I don't point to one sheriff as yeah. the the good sheriff. And I, I also always want to say when when there are sheriffs who are the the 
best in the country or who are making it the system the smallest. This story is actually still about Harry T. Moore mm-hmm. and the coach came after him because they've been the one pushing from the beginning. Yeah. 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 What brought you to this? So I um I come from Durham, North Carolina, which is where I'm sitting now. It's a city that is um, mostly black folks and increasingly has a large Latino population. And I'm a white guy who grew up here uh, with every opportunity in the world um, and who loves a lot of folks who are black and Latinx who these systems are not working for. Um, So all my work has been at this intersection of folks who I love from home and um, making the world more fair and just and doing so along alongside them and and that's meant fighting racial and justice and economic system and 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 more recently this particular work came because there's a sheriff in rural North Carolina just about 20 minutes from here 30 minutes from here named Terry Johnson who he, he was tried alongside Joe Arpaio in that Department of Justice case is how some folks might know his name. But he his deputy testified in that case that he would tell them to go get those taco eaters. Mm. He stopped Latino drivers at a rate four times higher than white folks. I say stopped, but he is still, still the sheriff of Alamance County. And, and folks in Alamance County who don't have papers, often won't go outside of the city lines for fear of going in his territory. Wow. So this this started actually just with me and some friends there saying, how do we get rid of this one particularly awful sheriff? And like the rest of this work, there had been more than a decade of deep, brave organizing in Alamance County. And in the case of Alamance County, it's still going on because he's he's still the sheriff there. But listen, I was so sorry to hear about folks driving you off the road there because in in Alamance County, during that Department of Justice case, way before I was involved, he would park his deputies outside of the the houses of people organizing. And, And this process of systematically scaring, intimidating folks who dare to ask the question is, is yeah. pretty ubiquitous. Yeah, yeah. I tell you, one of the things um, that I appreciate so much is the affiliation of our Latinx family, right? Our mm-hmm. Latino family in this fight. It opened my eyes a lot, right? Because sometimes when you are being oppressed and targeted, sometimes you only see your experience, and you don't really reference how other people are being impacted, even white people, right? Even yourself. And I won't bring you to the story that you told us at the retreat about your friend. And I know that's very emotional for you. Um, But the many people that I met there and the stories of how their families are being separated, how people are even, like you said, scared to go to the grocery stores because it so affects the very, the very day-to-day existence that we have. Mm-hmm. And for these people to have this much power to be able to cause such un, I mean, just mental illness, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is amazing. And, and so this fight, we've got to always make sure that we're referencing the, total, the totality of the experience of all of our citizens that are caught up in this web. And I think that's something that the organizations do so well. You know, the diversity that I find um, in your organizations, um, the affiliations and just the outreach to even include more because once you get in, start pulling the thread of that sweater, yeah, right? I mean, you unravel so much that you already didn't know was there, you yeah. know? I mean, we even got Dave here ready to, go pick it outside oh. in, in Massachusetts, right? Yeah. Right. We'll, 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 we'll connect on Bristol County when we're done. But I, I, I think this is, I think Linda's summation there is a nice way to, to close this conversation and give you the last word at the same time, Max. And that is around 
what she just said, that the totality of this, if you live in the United States, you're touched probably by a sheriff. Mm -hmm. And in our conversation, you have, have provided you know, myriad ways where anyone can engage, whether it's just going and requesting their own budget or going to their commission meeting mm -hmm. or telling their legislator if they you know, have an interpersonal reaction of, of, of doing their job at the state level. Uh, whatever, whatever that sort of vector of engagement is, if you live in the United States, you're touched by a sheriff, there's something you can do and want to give you that opportunity to invite people uh, right. to engage. Well, I, I think the first and foremost place that people can and should plug in is in, in their local communities. And I think you can go to sheriffaccountability.org and see some of the demands of communities for sheriff accountability and what you could be asking of your sheriff. Schedule a meeting with your sheriff. Understand who's organizing and asking questions of your sheriff already and go, go to their meetings, join, join their project. If you're with an organization, join Community for Sheriff Accountability and, um, and do so by, by going to the website and Sheriff Accountability and, con and, <clears throat> and using the contact link there. The, the, biggest, the biggest ask I have for folks is talk, talk to folks who you know who, who might not understand the role of the sheriff. Help educate your neighbor about what they can and can't do and about their historical role and their actual role. And, and then help, help them understand what um, safety looks like that doesn't depend on, on this office. And I think if we have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, then millions of those small conversations in our communities and really clear demands for our sheriffs and county commissioners and for our state legislators, then we are, we're going to build an incredibly powerful movement or we're going to increase the power of an already powerful movement and, and win this. Well, I tell you, you've done lion's share and I know you've got more to do. And part of that is bracing we've us. We've got more to do. Yeah. You ain't getting rid of me. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> um, but thank you for this small thing that we can do to to add, you know, thank you for, for all that you're doing, but thank you for, uh, for favoring me with, with your conversation, with your presence, with your knowledge, um, and with your time, you know, that's so important. So I love you, Max. And thank you so much for being with us today. Love you, Miss Linda. Thank you so much for having me all. Great to meet you, Dave. Max Rose is the founder and executive director of Sheriffs for Trusting Communities and with Linda has just released The Paid Jailer as part of Communities for Sheriff Accountability. You can find both of their websites under links we mentioned at fairfightinitiative.org. And now for a Fair Fight Initiative case update, where we update you on the work of the Fair Fight Initiative and what we're doing to crowdsource justice in this broken system. There is an incredible article by Brett Murphy uh, that features the Fair Fight Initiative uh, in USA Today. It published uh, at the beginning of the year, and it's called Behind the Blue Wall. And it talks about the price that whistleblower police officers face when they report misconduct among their ranks. And it specifically focuses on Jeremiah Ardwan, who was a member of the now defunct narcotics division at the Baton Rouge Police Department, and how his life has unraveled uh, after he alleges he was set up by a fellow member of the narcotics division right before he decided to blow the whistle. And there is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Fair Fight Initiative featured within the article because the Fair Fight Initiative has taken crowdsource donations and is now digging into 75 convictions that came from this corrupt narcotics division and trying to unravel who is be still behind bars uh, under circumstances that, frankly, have been shown to be corrupt coming from this division. And uh, Linda, it's just another example of of how we're crowdsourcing justice uh, and how we're continuing to dig into cases even after there may have been guilty verdicts or pleas when in a lot of the cases here in, in the Baton Rouge Police Department's narcotic divisions, the evidence may have been grossly tainted. 
Well, I will tell you, Dave, that, it, you know, in my experience, and I speak um, from a community that has been targeted historically uh, by the criminal justice system, there are so many cases and instances of this that we can speak about, right? People who have been convicted or what we would consider duly convicted uh, by a court of law and only to find out that there was evidence tampering, that there was, um, you know, less than scrupulous uh, officials behind arrest and, and then downright just setting people up. And that's why it is so important when I speak to members of my community that we need to support organizations, uh, Fair Fight Initiative and those who are actually trying to get uh, to the truth and to help so many people regain their lives um, and crowdsourcing for to end this mass incarceration because we know that representation is the key. A lot of people plead out to things that they haven't done. A lot of them are over prosecuted or downright falsely prosecuted because they don't have adequate uh, defense and representation. So definitely this is uh, something that I am very proud to be a part of. Well, now after the fact, the Fair Fight Initiative is taking crowdsourced funds to go through these cases and find out if this corrupt division threw people behind bars that, frankly, shouldn't be there. You can read the article on usatoday.com. It is behind a paywall. It's a good time to remind people to support good journalism. Uh, we will include it in the links we mentioned section of the Fair Fight Initiative podcast page. And now it happened to me where we actively listen to the testimony of one person's first-hand encounter with our broken system of mass incarceration and the impact on their life, their family, and their community. In this episode, Amelia Herrera in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, tells us about the circumstances behind her experience in the East Baton Rouge Parish Prison. Amelia is an amazing advocate and an amazing mother, and she chronicles her time spent actually in this facility. Amelia has just been such a leader in our community and in our coalition to reform uh, the ju criminal justice system here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and it is my honor for her story to be told. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here today and share my story on your platform. It happened to me. When I was arrested in 2015, I was incarcerated inside of the East Baton Rouge Parish Prison. I remember when I first got there how the sound of the gate that slammed shut behind me was so loud that I cringed. And it didn't dawn on me until I was inside of the cell waiting to be brought to the back. I remember the flashing light from my picture being taken. And I remember being brought into a room where you had to undress and be body searched to make sure that you're not bringing any contraband into the jail. I remember that because it was one of the most humiliating experiences of my entire 48 years. Afterwards, um, we were pushed down the line. And, and I like to say that it is much like that. It's like being cattle and you're just pushed down the line, a piece of meat just being pushed. We passed four cells, and it was two cells on each side um, once we were booked in. And I say we because there were a few other women. And this was the male cells, and they were so full that men were lying on the floor, hanging on the bars, shoulder to shoulder, feet foot to foot. It was, I could not imagine how they could put so many people in one place. It was like being in a meat locker. So I'm thinking, um, well, this is it, right? This is what jail is all about. Um, I had never been in trouble, had never been arrested, so I didn't know what to expect. But as I got booked and brought back to the back, I realized that 
when they say one of our nation's deadliest jails, East Baton Rouge Parish Prison, is by four holding up to that name. Um, I will never forget the sounds that I heard from screaming all day and all night from someone being locked into the medical lockdown because she had a mental crisis and rather than give her the medication that would have helped her and allowed her to be among the general population, they punished her by locking her in the cell. I remember those sounds. I still hear them. I remember my experiences and how I will carry those experiences with me for the rest of my life. I was incarcerated, or shall I say detained, because it is not a prison. It's actually a jail where people are held until they're seen in court. So um, the charges that were brought up against me were eventually dropped. But the several months that I spent waiting to go to court, I lost my house, my car, I had to come out and rebuild my family ties, um, find another job to sustain. So being incarcerated there, not only did I have to fight to survive in a place like that, because the prison culture inside of the parish is like nothing that I can describe to you. It is something out of your worst nightmare. And I had to acclimate myself to my surroundings and I was afraid every day. I would wake up in the night. I, I couldn't sleep. The, the couple of hours that I would sleep, there was always something going on. I would see abuses and I would also be at the end of some of those abuses. And I can tell you now that now in 2021, those memories and those emotional scars, because you get over the physical scars, but I still carry them with me and I am still trying to rebuild what has been taken from me being inside of the East Baton Rouge Parish Prison. One of our deadliest prisons in the nation. If I could do anything to speak to people to have them realize that this is not a place for mental health care. It is not a place to send someone because they're in a crisis or if they're fighting drug or substance abuse. None of these things are going to receive the help that is necessary inside of the parish. There's nothing in that place but torture and pain. I will forever for the rest of my days, remember my experiences from being locked inside of that place. From being on lockdown, from being in general population. I, I am horrified by those memories, by that experience, even now. It happened to me. Amelia Herrera an amazing advocate in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and it happened to her. We must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that. There's another quote. I mean, you could use another quote other than I have a dream. I mean, it's an amazing thing if you are actually interested in these issues, right? Point well taken and made, Dave. <laughs> and despite the finite disappointment of the stories we share on the Fair Fight Initiative podcast, we maintain infinite hope that we can end it. And boy, we sure got a lot of that this past, uh, you know, the MLK weekend, right? Oh, my goodness. It was amazing. Uh, we were honored to uh, be invited and to attend the grand opening of an amazing facility in New Orleans, Louisiana, um, from a group 
that is just done so much work in the community and for those who have been formerly incarcerated, vote, voice and, of the experience. And of course, in this case, experience meaning formerly incarcerated people and at the fore of that organization, Norris Henderson, who is a future guest of the Fair Fight Initiative podcast that you can look forward to coming soon to wherever you get your podcasts. And was really, I don't want to say a coming out party, Linda, but you know, they, they've been doing this work for years, but they have become such a force for change in New Orleans. And to see it sort of uh, materialize in the form of this building that they purchased and that they renovated for their needs and that they're going to use to serve formerly incarcerated people and to hear the stories and see the faces of the work that's being done within was was just incredibly moving. But it's the epitome of hope, right? It's the epitome of here are these individuals who are in a position that we would consider um, of their worst, right? That at, at their at a, a bad place in their lives, and and then to see the culmination of that with the opening of this building, all of the hard work, all of the um, advocacy, all of the learning, all of the sharing, um, and knowing that. Um, this scourge of mass incarceration in our community, we can't give up hope. We can't not stop um, providing opportunities for our brothers and sisters to be reacclimated into society, to come back to our communities, to be welcomed with resources that actually allow them to regain their lives and to be what they've always been to a degree of uh, uh, members of families of, of community and much needed. And I mean, I just, I was overwhelmed um, with just the, the sense of we can do this, you know, and what that building represents is stick to it if this. don't give up no matter how hard it it may seem you know well we will look forward to the five decade story of norris henderson advocating for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people we have highlights from the mlk weekend event in video form uh on the fair fight initiative podcast web page and you can learn more about vote nola and visit their site by going to the links we mentioned section Well, Dave, another one in the hat and what a show it has been. I have so enjoyed, like I said before, Max is one of my most, my favorite people and the work that is being done in the community towards directing, um, you know, the, the, the light on sheriffs and what they actually do in the community and shedding some light on that. I mean, it's going to be just game changing in a lot of a lot of communities um such good yeah work. it's it's one of those issues like you know people say oh well people in jail doesn't affect me if you look at this work of sheriffs sheriffs touch everyone's lives whether they know it mm -hmm. or not and they're doing it with your tax dollars in your community so there are things anyone in any community can do to make sure that's being done the right that's way. that's right that's right and the more people know the more they can garner that power and really change what's going on in their communities you know um so I'm, I'm inspired i'm inspired by you know what we've talked about today in our infinite hope segment and uh amelia's a riveting it happened to me the stories that we get from that always um, just really bring it home for why we're doing the work. And then, of course, the the cherry on top of all of that is I get time to spend time with you and and to talk to you, Dave. And that's really... So you're the one. Yeah. Huh? You, there's one person in the universe who, you know... <laughs> Let it be me. Let it be me. I'm that one. <laughs> Well, likewise, Linda, and thank you. It it's, it's, continues to be a wonderful yes. ride. Uh, the Fair Fight Initiative podcast is a production of the Fair Fight Initiative. Founded in 2017, the Fair Fight Initiative is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to crowdsourcing litigation, which advocates for equal treatment under the law, confronts systemic injustice, and helps victims challenge abusers of power in court. We believe justice crowdsourced is justice delivered. 
Crowdsourcing resources from our contributors, we're able to finance the litigation no attorneys will take because of the overwhelming upfront cost to seek justice in our legal system. You can learn more about our mission and to contribute at fairfightinitiative.org. And in Boston, I'm Dave Cartoonin. And in Baton Rouge, I'm Linda Franks. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you in two weeks. Bye everybody. Bye.